Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute's webinar series, Cancer Immunotherapy and You. Today's date is Wednesday, June 15, 2016, and the title of today's webinar is Demystifying Clinical Trials, Six Things You Need to Know. This is the second webinar in our three-part focus on clinical trials, which we are presenting as part of Cancer Immunotherapy Month in June. You can learn more about this awareness raising and education campaign by visiting cancerresearch.org forward slash June. This webinar is made possible with generous support from Genentech and LabAnswer and its employees, as well as the following. My name is Brian Brewer and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute. CRI is the world's first nonprofit organization dedicated exclusively to harnessing the immune system's power to conquer all types of cancer. We fund scientists around the world whose work has led to significant breakthroughs in cancer immunotherapy research and treatment. Several immunotherapies have received FDA approval and uh, for a number of hard to treat cancers and many more are available to patients through clinical trials. Over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll hear from an oncology nurse who will share her perspective on clinical trials and what patients need to know about them. We will open up the discussion to questions submitted by you. You can submit your questions at any time by typing in the Q&A pod on your screen. You can also tweet your questions at Cancer Research using the hashtag CRIWebinar. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on CRI's website and on our YouTube channel. Now it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker. Liz Hernandez is a clinical research coordinator in the gynecology service at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. At Roswell Park, she has also been a clinical research administrator of the, bone, of the blood and marrow transplant program, as well as a bone marrow transplant clinical nurse educator and coordinator, a clinical research nurse, and a critical care and floor nurse. She has authored or co-authored many publications in relation to blood and marrow transplant and has worked in oncology nursing for 23 years. Thank you, Lise, for joining us today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lise Hernandez, and I'm a clinical research coordinator at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. I work in GYN oncology, primarily with ovarian cancer patients. I'm here to discuss how to talk to patients about a clinical trial. By the end of this discussion, you should be able to understand what a clinical trial is and why it is important to participate in clinical trials. You should understand the basics of what patients need to know before signing up for a clinical trial. And finally, you should have a basic understanding of the types of immunotherapies used in clinical trials. The WHO defines it as follows. A clinical trial is any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. Interventions include, but are not restricted to, drugs, cells, and other biological products, surgical procedures, radiological procedures, devices, behavioral treatments, process of care changes, preventative care, etc. Phase one studies look at the safety of XYZ to determine what effect it has on humans. Phase two studies are looking for specific disease response to the new drug or drugs. Phase three studies compare the effect of the new drug or drugs with the standard of care treatment on you and your type of disease to determine which treatment is better. Phase four studies are for FDA approved drugs for the purposes of marketing only. There are many reasons to participate in clinical research trials. However, it is voluntary and has to be the patient's decision. They have to be open to the idea and understand that they may decide to withdraw at any time from the study. This is important because it might help the patient by 
controlling or eradicating their disease. You could be helping future generations by finding the future standard of care for their disease, as our previous generations have done for us by their participation. You could benefit by being one of the few to have access to potentially new treatment options. You can take an active role in your own health care by participating in clinical research, and you can have expert medical care at leading institutions while participating in an important medical research. It is most important to explain to the patient the treatment plan with specifics regarding time commitment. If you have visual tools, include them in your presentation. Many patients need to work while receiving treatment. It is important that they understand upfront what their schedule will look like. Don't be afraid to stress the potential benefit of the treatment using facts. You don't need to give false hope, but rather stress the important positive potential for treatment. You must always include and discuss the potential side effects of the treatment. However, there are ways to do it without scaring the patient. I always compare the potential list of side effects to reading a Tylenol label. We need to list all the potential side effects, but this doesn't mean that all will happen or that any will happen. They should be listed in order from the most common to the least common. Sometimes it helps to share what side effects have been seen in your patient population if you have patients already enrolled. You must discuss what the cost will be for the patient. You may refer them to your financial counselor to discuss specifics if that exists at your facility. What you don't want to happen is for the patient to receive a bill which they were unaware they would be responsible for when they signed up for the trial. Make sure the patient knows who will have access to their information. Most consents will have a HIPAA section outlining all the specifics. Save time at the end to answer any questions. Let the patient know who will be available to answer their questions throughout the conduct of the trial and provide them an email or telephone number of that person. What is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is a broad category of anti-cancer therapies that uses the body's immune system to fight cancer cells. These cells are different than normal cells as they do not die normally. They are rapidly dividing cells that produce at a very fast rate. These cells often change or mutate to evade the immune system. Immunotherapy drugs are designed to alert the immune system about these mutated cells so it can locate and destroy them. There are several types of different immunotherapy in cancer research. I'll briefly describe some types used in the clinical research trial, including checkpoint inhibitors, vaccines, adoptive T cell therapy, and oncolytic virus therapy. Checkpoint inhibitors are drugs often made of antibodies that unleash an immune system attack on cancer cells. They work by blocking normal proteins on cancer cells or proteins on the T cells that respond to them. Vaccines are medications that help the body fight disease. They actually help train the immune system to recognize and destroy harmful substances, in this case, cancer cells. Cancer treatment vaccines boost the immune system ability to recognize and destroy antigens. Cancer cells contain molecules called cancer-specific antigens on their surface, which healthy cells do not have. When these molecules are given to a person, the molecules act as antigens. Then they stimulate the immune system to recognize and destroy cancer cells that contain these molecules on their surface. Most cancer vaccines also contain adjuvants, which are substances that may help strengthen the immune system. Adoptive T-cell therapy is a form of personalized medicine which is now used in various early and late stage clinical trials. These trials are testing strategies to infuse tumor-related infiltrating lymphocytes. This is otherwise known as passive immunization. Our immune system works to recognize and destroy abnormal mutated cells, but the abnormal cells that eventually become cancer are the ones that slip past the system. The idea behind this therapy is to make immune cells, specifically T lymphocytes, sensitive to cancer cells so that malignant cells can be targeted and attacked throughout the body. 
Oncolytic virus therapy refers to the virus that kills tumor cells selectively, sparing the normal surrounding tissue. As a mode of therapy, oncolytic virus is used to self-recognize and infect the mutated cancerous cells, which replicates within the infected cells, followed by the release of new virion that simultaneously amplifies the input dose. New virions later spread and infect the adjacent cancerous cells. Thus, infected cells often undergo pathologic programmed cell death, otherwise known as apoptosis. Why is this important in my line of work? The side effects of immunotherapy are more tolerable than chemotherapy. Patients are able to work and do their normal activity more so than with chemotherapy due to the mild side effects. Ovarian cancer is the leading cause of death from GYN cancers in the U.S. Each year, over 22,000 women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer and over 14,000 will die. It is referred to as the silent killer. This is because the disease has often spread before symptoms appear. Despite advances in surgery and chemotherapy over the last 20 years, only modest progress has been made in improving overall survival in patients with ovarian cancer. Although most patients respond to first-line therapy, more than 80% will have a recurrence, and more than half will die within five years of diagnosis. Therefore, new treatment modalities are needed in order to improve the prognosis of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer. In a study by Dr. Colneo Dunsey of Roswell Park Cancer Institute, patients in first remission treated with the NYESO1 cancer vaccine showed a medium time to progression of 21 months compared to a historical average of 16 months. In more recent studies, scientists treated 28 patients in second or third remission with the NYESO1 vaccine and showed an average of 22 months of time to progression compared to an average of four months among those who lack the NYESO1 expression. This is notable because for interval for second and third remission, it's typically shorter than patients in first remission with averages of four to 10 months less. The results of this study provide an important foundation for further clinical development of immunotherapeutic strategies particularly in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. In conclusion, the following tips may be helpful for successful approval to in immunotherapy clinical trials. Know your protocol inside and out before you speak to the patient. If they ask a question you cannot answer, let them know you will find out and get back to them. Always be honest when explaining the treatment procedure and schedule. Let them know if there will be multiple tubes of blood drawn, et cetera. Let them know what to expect. Be available to answer questions throughout the study. If you will be away, leave the name and number of your coverage so they don't feel abandoned. Most importantly, once the patient is enrolled, be sure to follow them closely for problems. Make sure you know when they have their appointments. Stop by and talk with them. It may not be required at certain time points, but it's nice for them to know you are always watching them from the far, be it lab work, clinic notes, et cetera. You want them to know you are continuing to follow them even after they go off treatment. I hope you find that information helpful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lise, uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> some exciting things to see both uh, not only in the treatment of ovarian cancer, but also uh, many other cancer types as well. Of course, we know that Roswell Park has, a, has an amazing um, gynecologic cancer program. So um, thank, you. thank you for sharing that. So we talked about the, the different phases and, and what they all mean. I think one thing I'd, I'd like to just make sure that everyone who's watching um, understands is that uh, one of the myths of uh, clinical trials is that um, only the phase three trials are the ones that where you, you have the greatest chance of, of getting a good drug that might work for you. Of course, we've seen in immunotherapy that some of these drugs have been approved by the FDA at only phase one or phase two. So uh, can you say a little bit about, about that? So um, I'm lucky enough to work with Dr. Odunzi, who is uh, 
been instrumental in developing these new vaccine trials in the phase one area. And um, yes, patients do often ask, um, I, I do vaccine trials here at Roswell, and they often ask, um, are, am I getting the real drug or am I getting the placebo? And I say, no, uh, there's no placebo involved at this stage. And, um, you yeah. know, so I'm, I'm here with the phase one um, administrator. I'm hoping she can help um, mention them. Dawn DePaulo. Hi, my name is Dawn DePaulo, and I'm the clinical research administrator for the Phase One program here at Roswell Park. And I'm trying to find the camera. Hello. Um, we have a variety of studies that are uh, actively accruing, and we are accruing patients in the Phase One program. And what we what we're doing these days is really very exciting because um, things are different different now than they were even just five years ago. Um, these days, when we do phase one studies, we have a lot of information already. We're already, our, our doctors and our scientists are very educated on phase one studies and the science behind the chemicals that they're using and the molecules that they've been studying so intensely. So we're very smart these days. And what we do is, um, in our program, we have studies that take that new molecule, that new chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And we compete. And it helps to enhance that. that we are now seeing responses that are better than stable disease. We're always happy with stable disease, but when we can get a partial remission from somebody out of a phase one trial, it's amazing. But it's happening now because we're actually we're putting those old time chemotherapies together with these with these new drugs and we're getting even better responses without getting um, as many side effects. Yeah, you touch on you touch on a very exciting area of uh, by the way, thank you Don <laughs> for joining us. Thank you, Don. Why we have her here? <laughs> um, you, you touched on uh, Don touched on th this idea of combinations and uh, combining traditional or conventional therapies with these new cutting edge therapies. And uh, as she as she mentioned, there's a lot of really exciting results coming out of that. I think one of the things that uh, <clears throat> one of the things that clinical trials are trying to answer is uh, what are those optimal combinations. And how do we identify patients? Can, one, one, thing, um, one thing that comes up in, uh, increasingly in, in clinical trials as we learn more and more about which patients are more likely to benefit from a treatment than others, how, what, what does a patient need to know about what are called biomarkers or mutations? Or what other, what other sorts of information should a patient already have um, when looking at a clinical trial? I'm sorry, we, we're sorry, you cut out a little bit. Could you repeat that? Okay. Sure. Um, I was asking, um, you know, their, their clinical trials have a, a list of eligibility criteria. Some of them may be about, you know, you must have specific mutations or you must have um, already been treated with a certain uh, course of therapy. Um, what other sorts of information do patients need to have mm -hmm. when they're looking into enrolling into a clinical trial? Without the, sorry, we were having some technical difficulties, but uh, every each clinical trial, as I understand your question, each cl clinical trial has its own set of eligibility criteria, and clinicaltrials.gov uh, will list the main cri eligibility criteria, and it will also list uh, the contact person at the institutes uh, where the trial is being run. And uh, usually patients go with the closest facility. And uh, we at Roswell, we have the 1-877-ASK-RPCI line. And um, uh, those, uh, yes, they, they will direct those questions um, to all the research coordinators. And we contact the patients directly. So it's, you're saying it's, it's um, individual to each trial. Each trial has its own set of criteria. That is correct. Okay. Um, and thank you also for sharing your uh, the Roswell Parks clinical trial uh, resource for patients who are, are looking. Now, is that only for uh, trials taking place at Roswell Park, or can they get information on 
trials happening at other sites? So um, our ASCAR PCI line is strictly for our studies. However, I, we, we, we generally have helped patients um, close to their home um, enrolled in trials. We coordinate with other clinical research coordinators at other facilities, and I've worked um, recently over the last couple of months uh, at, with the Cleveland Clinic as well as uh, UPMC to get patients um, enrolled. That's great. I, I'd also just like to take an opportunity to, to share with our viewers that the Cancer Research Institute provides a clinical trial finder that's focused on just immunotherapy. So if you're specifically looking for an immunotherapy trial, uh, you can come to our website, cancerresearch.org, and find our clinical trial finder there. Um, so uh, another question that, that we often get is, um, you know, you mentioned that a, a pa when a patient enrolls in a trial, they become part of a, a research effort. They, they are contributing to research, and uh, there's certain commitments that a patient needs to make. What, what sort of things should patients think about before they consider enrolling in a clinical trial? And specifically, um, talking about commitment, there's, there's a lot of tests, there's a lot of follow-up. Um, how, how do you talk to your patients about that, and what's their response when you tell them that? So um, the reality is that there are often more tests involved when they are in a clinical research trial. However, many patients um, do like that more because they feel like they're being followed more closely. It isn't that uh, non-protocol patients aren't followed. It's just that the cl clinical research coordinators become like, their, we always say, we're your new best friend. We're your contact for everything. Any problem, you call us. Um, and um, they know that they're, they're being followed for every little thing. Um, and they like the idea of having maybe more frequent uh, blood work, uh, specifically in our area, CA125s, and um, uh, CT scans are more frequent than maybe if they were just, you know, being followed um, without uh, being on a study. Uh, and as far as the, we always discuss it up front, I do make sure, as I said in my presentation, I always do talk about, because sometimes it, it, that involves more blood work, and um, sometimes it's a large volume of blood work. And so you like them to know up front and not be surprised. You don't want the patient to get down in phlebotomy and say, whoa, you know, the, what is all this for? And I try to explain, well, that is really the way that we get all the information for future studies and to know how well patients are doing is based on the results of all of that extra blood work. That's fantastic. Um, I, I wondered uh, it, when a patient, since they're, since they're committing and, and giving so much, and yes, uh, you know, we know that there's a, a benefit that the patient receives of having that extra layer of care um, and attention. Uh, what happens when, let's say, you treat a patient and they're on the trial and then, then they're done, they complete the trial. Um, how do they find out about the rest of the results? Do you, do you stay in touch with patients once they go off trial to, to let them know when a study has been completed and what the results are? Or are patients interested in that at all? Some patients are interested and at least in, in my department, our patients are, uh, very few patients are lost to follow up. Even the patients who, uh, I have several patients who travel from the West Coast for treatment. They like to follow on to the next study. Uh, I have some patients who have gone on multiple vaccine trials still in remission hoping to go on to the next one. But yes, we do share. Um, I have uh, had patients who were on blinded studies and once the unblinded, takes place, I, I let them know this and other, like mainly phase three studies, but you let them know uh, which, which arm they were on, things like that. But yes, patients are interested. Some are not, but most are interested in the, the results of the studies, and I do share that with them. I, I'm lucky great. enough to, to have a close follow-up with them. That's great. Um, you know, there's, there's a very disturbing statistic that um, I come across every once in a while, which is that um, you know, some fewer than 5% of patients who are actually eligible to or may be eligible to enter in a clinical trial don't avail themselves of that opportunity. And there's a, there, there are a lot of reasons for that, and, and, and we can't go into all of them here. But what I'm wondering is what, does, what do you and other oncology nurses and doctors and the Roswell Park Cancer Institute do to help um, point patients uh, in the direction of other treatment options that they may not be considering? 
Well, we, we have often uh, asked patients who have been on other clinical trials with their, with their same disease, so patients who are um, very undecided, we, of course, with HIPAA, we would contact the, the patient and ask if they would be interested in talking to a, a potential patient for a clinical trial and how they, what they experienced. And um, I found that very helpful for our patients. It's nice because they, they do, they wind up um, having a support system as well. But we also, uh, we, we sort of try to break the myth about, you know, there was, uh, I, I'm sure you're aware of all the, um, the historical um, things that have happened to uh, make patients uh, skeptical. Uh, they don't want to be, you know, quote, lab rat and things like that. But we, we explain uh, definitely the, how, the, how research has changed over the years. Uh, the informed consent, we, I always explain to them, we have to tell you everything that possibly could happen. Doesn't mean that it will. But um, you know that we're we're not going to do anything that uh, if we if we find out new news that shows that it's um, not of benefit, we would you know withdraw you from the study, and that's just part of what we do here. So, uh, but definitely uh, connecting people with patients who have gone through it. Um, in, in addition, Roswell's very uh, we're very pro research. We have a great research center here and our department, and we have uh, posters all around uh, with patients um, who have been on our clinical trials with their little slogan, whatever they wanted to say. I, I chose uh, to be on a research trial because of this, and it's, they're posted throughout. We have hundreds of them throughout the hospital. So I think that helps, too. So it, sound, it sounds like uh, you know, making a decision to enter a clinical trial is one that takes a lot of thought and can be fraught with fear and uncertainty. So um, your, your role must be invaluable in uh, assuring patients that you know, what they're about to do um, you know, is meaningful and uh, may benefit them, hopefully will benefit them. Um, let's see. You have a we, question we also, from the... Uh, we like to give them time. Sorry, we're, we're just having a little bit. Could you repeat that? Oh, no, you were, you were just about to say that you like to There's give a them delay. time. Oh, we, yeah, oh, sorry. See, there's a delay on both ends. We, uh, we like to give them a, meet with the patient, the doctor, talk with them first to make sure they're, they would be interested in the clinical trial. And we give them, we meet with them in private. And um, the research coordinator will always go over the consent form, explain every t everything to them, and then we would uh, let them take it home with them, uh, discuss it with their families. We also do, uh, it, it's kind of nice because we have a delay in that we, we here always do something called a, um, an insurance verification. Before we would allow them to even sign the consent, we make sure their insurance company is, is uh, going to approve the study. So that, in a way, that gives them time to say, okay, Come back tomorrow. Don't sign right away. We want to make sure that you've understood. Call me. Here's my card. Here's my number. Call me with any questions after you've read it and after your family has read it. Um, and that's that's sort of what we do. But I, you were going to say something. Oh well, you were just you you just you mentioned insurance, and of course that's paying for healthcare is um, you know most yeah. people can't can't do it on their own, and um, insurance is very important and. The thing about clinical trials is some of those expenses are paid for uh, by the sponsor of the trial or, or by the host institution. Um, what, what are some of the out-of-pocket expenses that uh, patients may have to deal with that aren't covered by the trial? So a lot of out-of-pocket expenses would be um, co-pays because the insurance company, even if it's approved, as you know, some things are covered by the clinical trial, but everything can't be. Not all, you know, clinic visits, uh, labs, uh, co-pays for labs, et cetera. So uh, co-pays for the lab tests, the, the CAT scans, the uh, clinic visits. Um, so the medications, you, as you say, if it's a study medication, it's going to be covered, and it's going to be uh, given to them right at our institute through our investigational pharmacy, so there's no copay involved there. But I would say the worst is copays for uh, office visits and things like that. 
And of course, again, we, we get it approved um, by the insurance so that nobody gets stuck. I mean, 10 years ago, that didn't exist. Wow. Yet, transportation and lodging, that is one thing, Don, Don, that's why we haven't, Don mentioned, because I actually, on my, especially on my vaccine trials, I have patients traveling uh, in for the study. Most of my patients are traveling in for the study. And, you know, uh, we try to help with lodging. There are, you know, American Cancer Society often has uh, facilities where they can, you know, stay free of charge. But, you know, they're paying their own flight to get here. And, uh, you know, if they have to have, uh, think about it, their pets, you know, being cared for, child care, so, you know, at home, you know, that it costs money. So, um, you know, Roswell Park uh, is an outstanding research organization. I think I read that it was actually the world's first uh, institution to dedicate itself to cancer research exclusively. Um, so a long, a long pedigree of excellence there. Uh, but you. not all patients um, have access to centers like Roswell Park or um, other major cancer research institutions throughout the country. Many patients um, must go to their community oncologists. Uh, do you ever get contacted by community oncologists or in, your, in the line of your, your work or networking, do you talk with other oncology nurses um, who are at these community oncology centers? And, and what sorts of things do they ask you? So we have referrals oftentimes from small community hospitals. I, I, I'd say very frequently, maybe four or five times a month, I get calls from oncology nurses, even oncologists themselves, who would like to refer their patients. They've, they've heard through, you know, websites or they've gone to a recent um, uh, conference and have heard about the vaccine trials and things like that. And they, they say, gee, my patient I think would be a great uh, a, a great study, you know, person for that study and what's all involved. And you'd be surprised at how much the local oncologists uh, will actually do, they go out of their way, well, I can get this today, I can, you know, do anything you need to, to um, see if this patient is going to be potentially eligible before we, you know, have them make the flight or whatever. But, you know, that's, it's, we work very well with other institutes. It's, it's that's great. exciting, yeah. Uh, let's see, I think that's all the time we have for today's webinar. Um, and I, I thank you, Lise, for spending this time with us and uh, so helping much. us yeah, to outline what, are, what, what the things are that patients need to know about cancer immunotherapy clinical trials. Um, I'd like to just once again thank our presenting sponsors, Genentech and LabAnswer and its employees. I'd also like to thank uh, the following sponsors for their generous support, AbbVie, Celdex, New Link Genetics, and Regeneron. If you are interested in learning more about cancer immunotherapy, about immunotherapy clinical trials, or if you'd like to uh, learn or read stories or watch videos of patients who've been treated with immunotherapy, you can go to our website that we've built. It's designed uh, especially for uh, cancer patients and their caregivers. The URL is theanswertocancer.org. Uh, you can also find our clinical trial finder service there as well. Uh, we also encourage you to join the Cancer Immunotherapy Support Community, which is hosted by our partner Inspire.com, to connect with others who are interested in discussing new, this new way to treat cancer. You can go to bit.ly forward slash inspirecri and register today. I mentioned earlier that June is Cancer Immunotherapy Month, and as part of this awareness raising campaign, we invite you to help us white out cancer by sharing a photo at whiteoutcancer.com and dedicating it to someone you know who has been touched by cancer. Finally, I encourage you to register for our third webinar in our clinical trial series, Three Things to Watch For in Clinical Trials This Year, which will be presented by Cancer Research Institute CEO and Director of Scientific Affairs, Dr. Jill O'Donnell Tormey. Thank you again, Lise and Dawn, if you're still there in the room, yes. and all of those who have joined us for today's webinar. Uh, once again, this webinar will be available for viewing on the Cancer Research Institute website and on our YouTube channel within the week. You can view this and other past webinars at cancerresearch.org 
forward slash webinars. And uh, at the conclusion of this, we hope that you'll take a moment to provide us feedback via a survey that you'll be directed to uh, very shortly. So thank you all again, and I uh, hope you have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Thank you.